Let's take a copy of God's Word and turn to Colossians chapter 2. Continue our journey through Colossians and our study presently on the dangers of legalism, mysticism, and asceticism, real threats to spiritual growth, spiritual health, to true biblical spirituality, which is what we're aiming for. So let's read uh, beginning in verse 16 uh, this morning, chapter 2. The word of the Lord, given through the pen of the beloved Apostle Paul. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. That's what we're aiming at, right? This kind of growth. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Lord, we thank you for your word. Please open our eyes and our hearts and our ears. Please attend the preaching of your word. Lord, by the power of your spirit, help us to behold wonderful things from your word and to see the beauty and glory and sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ as supreme and sovereign over all. We commit this sermon into your hands and ask that you would work in our hearts through the preaching of the word as you promised to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, what are we talking about here? Okay. What are we talking about here? I want to keep us focused on what the main objective is. What is Paul's main objective? Paul wants a spiritual church. He wants a mature church. That's what he is laboring for. That is what he is working for. And so he gives them the the doctrine that they need to grow into mature saints. And he tries to protect them from the errors that will lead them astray from the truth. From the various isms. And in our particular context, we're looking at legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. Now, we all want to be spiritual people, don't we? I mean, you want to be spiritual. I want to be spiritual. We all want to be spiritual people, but we want to be biblically spiritual. What does that mean? Let me take you back to a definition we looked at a couple of weeks ago by Dr. Don Whitney. And he writes about biblical spirituality, that it includes but transcends the human spirit and involves the pursuit of God and the things of God through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in accordance with God's self-revelation, that is the Bible. Let me break that down a little bit so we can get our arms around it because it's important. This is the pursuit that we want to be on. We want to make sure that we are on. So the first part of that equation, biblical spirituality includes and transcends us. It is not a sort of navel-gazing where we are just introspective, trying to dig out all the stuff that is within us, where we're sitting around sort of contemplating ourselves all day. No, we need God, and we look inside and we see that we need God, and because of our union with Christ, we want to grow up in Christ, and we're rightly concerned about ourselves, but spirituality transcends us, because looking at ourselves drives us to God for our help. So it includes and transcends us. The second part of his definition, it involves the pursuit of God and the things of God. That's what a spiritual person does. He pursues God and he pursues 
the things of God. That's what he's about. That's what spirituality is of any sort. It's the pursuit of God. Now, what makes biblical spirituality biblical or different is the next phrases. Phrase number three, I'm taking, or section number three from his definition, through Jesus Christ. So biblical spirituality includes and transcends us and involves the pursuit of God, the things of God, through Jesus Christ. And so from the mindset of the person who wants to pursue biblical spirituality, there's only one way to pursue God and the things of God, and that is through the one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And so we come to God through Christ, through Christ. Well, the next section of that is we do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so to pursue God through Christ, we need the Holy Spirit to energize, enable us. And so the sort of spirituality that we're talking about requires dependency on God. It requires dependency on God. And the final section of that definition Biblical spirituality is in accordance with God's self-revelation. That is the Bible. So what is our textbook? <clears throat> what grounds us, informs us, enables us, drives us, directs us in this pursuit of God and the things of God through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God's book grounds us, drives us, enables us, directs us. The Word of God. This is what sets biblical spiritualities apart from other sorts of spiritualities. Again, as you talk to the man on the street, a lot of folks would say, I'm a spiritual person, right? But what do they mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is you're pursuing God through Christ and the power of the Spirit according to the Word of God, according to God's inerrant, infallible Word. So what is it <clears throat> that we are seeking in this pursuit of God? What are, we, what are we seeking to accomplish in this pursuit of God? Well, let's look at what Paul was aiming at, and that's our goal as well. If you go back to chapter 1 and verse 24, Paul says that he is working for the body. He's working for the sake of the church. In verse 25, he's working to make the Word of God fully known. In verse 25, 6 and 27, he is working, of chapter 1, he is working to display the greatness of the riches of the glory of Christ and our hope in him, and he does this by proclaiming Christ with the aim of making or presenting everyone mature in Christ. And so Paul lays down his life, he makes the sacrifice, he puts forth maximum effort to make the word of God known, so that the glory of Jesus will be displayed, so that the church will not be tossed back and forth immature, so that the church will be a mature church. That's what his ministry was all about. Not just sort of feeding the church some milk and hoping that they're satisfied, but training up the church to a mature church. So what does Paul want? Well, here's his vision statement. In part, he wants a mature church grounded in the Word, centered on Jesus, that displays His glory. That's what Paul wants. That's what you want as a Christian. And in chapter 2, we see him struggling. He's working for the church. He wants, he wants their hearts encouraged. That's a good aim, right? When Paul thinks of the church, he wants an encouraged church. He wants a church that's knit together in love, he says where they can reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of Christ. So we could expand Paul's vision statement a little more. Paul wants a mature church, grounded in the Word, centered on Jesus, displaying His glory, that is encouraged, that is knit together in love, that is growing in understanding in the knowledge of Christ. In the knowledge of Christ, and we could add another phrase to that, walking in Jesus Christ, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, abounding with thanksgiving, chapter 2, verse 6. That's the vision. That's what Paul is aiming for. A mature church grounded in the Word, displaying the Lord Jesus Christ, knit together in love, encouraged, growing, rooted, and developing, and being fruitful to the glory of the Lord. 
And he knows the way to get there. And he didn't have to read any church growth books. He didn't have to get on the church growth mailing list. He didn't have to learn about all the things that, all the strategies out there that cause a church to grow, so-called. He knew what would cause the church to grow. Deep and up, mature and fruitful. And he knew that if the church was to grow, that they would find in Christ, according to chapter 2, verse 3, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They must be centered on Jesus Christ. They must be a Christ-saturated, Christ-centered, Christ-focused church if they were to grow into maturity. Anything less would weaken and diminish them and take, because it takes their eyes off of Christ. And so he warns the church. He warns the church about those things that will lead them to immaturity or keep them in immaturity. He warns them about the things that will divide them, discourage them, that will sever their love for one another, that will diminish them, that will diminish Christ in their eyes. He warns the church about those sorts of things. He warns about false teachers and false philosophy here in Colossians chapter 2. He really, he really steps up to the plate and he hits the ball strongly and he hits it straight and he's clarifying for the church the essence of Christ and the danger of false doctrine. He tells the church, listen, just as we are tempted today, folks are promising out there all sorts of spiritual treasures all sorts of pathways to wisdom and all sorts of pathways to true spirituality. Paul says, look, in Jesus are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all about Christ. If you want to have wisdom, if you want to have knowledge, if you want to be a spiritual person, it's all about Jesus. Knowing this will protect you from being kidnapped by man-made philosophies that center on external things but have no capacity to change the heart and make you a holy man or holy woman. You've got to know Christ. There are no shortcuts. And you've got to know who He is. So we unpacks who Jesus is in chapter 1. Again, in chapter 2, Christ is supreme over all. And it's through Him that we're made alive. It's through Him that we're forgiven. It's through Him that we're rooted and built up in the faith. There are no shortcuts. So if we were to give an altar call this morning, and tell you that if you'll just walk down the aisle and rededicate your life, and you'll be zapped with a shortcut to spirituality, we wouldn't be telling you the truth. There are no shortcuts. Yes, God in special times and special seasons and times of revival does unusual and unique works, and, and often those things happen rather rapidly, but God's normative plan is that He is developing His people through the Word of God into greater maturity with their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. No shortcuts, no man-made strategies to a higher spiritual plane. But there are plenty of religious salesmen who will try to sell you something different than that. And he says in verse 4, they'll present you with plausible arguments. And their goal in verse 7 is to take you captive. They want you on their team. Of course they do, right? I mean, they want their team to be as large as possible. The more people, the more excitement. And so the false teachers are persuaded by their false doctrine, and they want everyone else to be excited about their false teaching, and so they're recruiting. Come join my team. Here's the team to the deeper spiritual life. You see a lot of book titles that are framed like that. Here's, here's how to get to the, the deeper, more profound spiritual life. Here's the secret. Here's the key that unlocks the door that only a few select people have, but you can have it too. Here's how you become really spiritual, and they'll take you captive. But he says, it's not according to Christ. They're taking you back. They're not moving you forward. Paul wants the church moving forward, growing, deepening in the Word of God, in the things of Christ. Now, his arguments about false doctrine and false teaching are presented in three basic ways. And we put the categories legalism, 
mysticism and asceticism, but understand, I think what we're dealing with here is one philosophy that has overlapping elements from all three. I think there's Jewish legalism, there's sort of pagan mysticism, and asceticism. So we have legalism in the church that is flowing with sort of a Gnostic thinking and mystical thinking and is producing ascetics, those who are rigorous with their body and their attempt to achieve the higher spiritual life. And so I think we have a blend here of the three into one thing called the philosophy that's offering the plausible argument for the church. Now, Grace Community Church, I want you to hear what Paul is saying to us here. We cannot be a mature church. We cannot be a mature church grounded in the Word. We cannot be a mature church grounded in the Word, centered on Jesus, displaying His glory, encouraged, knit together, growing in understanding and knowledge of Christ, walking in Jesus, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, and abounding with thanksgiving if we become enamored with legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. And so we have to fight the isms. And that's my role this morning as a pastor, to do the best I can to help us as a church to fight the isms that are out there that will take us captive, take us off the main thing, take us away from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we began looking at legalism last Lord's Day, and I don't want to replow all of the ground, but I do want to sort of bring some new material into that as we move forward to mysticism and asceticism. When we think of legalism, I think we can think of legalism in a couple of different ways. I've heard it described as raw legalism. Now, raw legalism is legalism that adds something to justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. So it adds some sort of work on the front end of salvation. In order to be saved, you've got to you know, have Christ plus, fill in the blank, whatever it is. Some obedience to a certain law or a certain practice or a certain custom, whatever it may be. That's raw legalism. And Paul says if an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel other than the gospel that uh, I've preached to you, let him be damned to hell. I mean, Paul goes to war against that sort of legalistic false doctrine. But I think there's another sort of legalism. We might call it Christian legalism. People who come to Christ by grace through faith in Him, and yet after they come to Christ by grace through faith, they get sidetracked into trying to jump through hoops in order to keep God happy with them. So they've come to God, they've heard, you know, I'm under no condemnation in Christ, but now I've got to keep God happy, and so I've got to get on my little will and start riding the will. And if I can ride the will fast enough and long enough, then God will be happy with me. Now, I would imagine that all of us struggle at some level with Christian legalism, right? I mean, we're growing in the faith, we're trying to navigate our way through this world. We're trying to understand God's word and we want to be faithful to apply God's truth to our lives. And we, if we really look within and examine ourselves by scripture and look to Christ, we're going to find no doubt that we all, probably all of us in this room, have legalistic tendencies. We understand salvation is by grace, but we keep falling back into a sort of sanctification by rules, regulations, to-do lists, focusing on externals, and we, if we're not careful, we're neglecting the heart. And that's one of the real problems with legalism. It focuses on what's outside. It doesn't focus on what's inside. That's why one of the, my favorite parenting books, Shepherding a Child's Heart, I love the title and I love the message of the book because it's, it tries to address the heart. Not the surface, first and foremost, but the heart. And so we can fall prey to various rules and regulations and to-do lists and neglect the heart. And so Christian A has certain scruples about any number of things. They can't understand why Christian B doesn't have the same scruples about those things. And it may be that Christian A is really concerned about biblical teaching. And so he's built this sort of practical way to make sure he's faithful to biblical teaching and sort of the practical way that he's built to try to be faithful to biblical teaching has become itself, in his, in his eyes, equal to biblical teaching. And so his method has become doctrine, biblical doctrine, in a sense, in his heart. 
And so he's concerned about Christian B that doesn't do things exactly the same way that he does those things. So he builds an external, extra-biblical, and extra-biblical protections or stimuli to help him reach objectives because, after all, Christian A wants to play it safe. He doesn't want to step over the line, and so he wants to do everything he can, play it safe, and so he, he builds these protections, and he wants to err on the side of safety. So he creates a safety net, and that net has a tendency to grow with rules and regulations and rituals and all these things. And eventually, the biblical truth is hidden away beneath all of the regulations, beneath all of the rules and regulations. Listen, legalism is a sin. Whether it is raw legalism or whether it is what we're calling sort of a Christian legalism, and it must be rooted out of our hearts and out of our churches because it grows out of a heart of pride. It promotes a false spirituality and diminishes the glory and work of Jesus Christ. It also separates true Christians from one another. The sort of Christian variety does. Now, legalism is not insisting by faith on obedience to the clear teachings of Scripture. That's not legalism. It can be. If it's an external thing, if it's sort of done in one's own power, if it doesn't grow out of a transformed heart. But legalism is not, you know, uh, insisting on obeying Scripture. All Christians want to obey the Word of God. But how must we do that? Well, Paul tells us here that he struggles in verse 29 with all his energy, speaking of God's energy, with all of God's energy that he powerfully works in him. So Paul wants to obey God, but he wants to obey God in the energy of God, not in his own strength, not in his own power. And so as believers, we want to obey the commands of Scripture. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't say, work for your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. So it's like this. God has deposited salvation in. The Christian is a gold miner. He digs salvation out. He works it out. But the next phrase is essential in Philippians 2.12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so the Christian goes after obedience with maximum effort. But he does so understanding that God has given him the desire, and it is God that must enable him to pursue obedience with this sort of commitment, with fear and trembling. So we want to obey Christ, right? We want to follow what the Scripture clearly tells us. And we want to do so in the power of the Spirit. According to the Lord Jesus Christ. Grounded in the Word of God. Because that's biblical spirituality. That's what biblical spirituality is. But legalism's all the additions to that. There may be, you know, okay, this is what God tells me to do. Well, here are all the ways that I'm going to do that. And those ways become, in the mind of the legalistic person, as important to them over time as Scripture itself. And it becomes a a standard of spirituality and a means of jumping through enough hoops so that God will give you the thumbs up. Okay, you did good today. You read your Bible and you prayed and you, you you were nice to the children and you went to church on Sunday... Good job. All right. Let's try again tomorrow. Let's hop back on that treadmill at 4 o'clock in the morning, and let's ride it again. Let's ride it again. When we talk about legalism, we're, not all, we're also not talking about various household rules. I mean, every household has to have certain rules to function, right? Or things will just fall into chaos. The Bible doesn't say you have to have a certain time, certain bedtime for your children, does it? You might wish it said that. <laughs> You might wish you could bring the law down to sort of add to your authority that it had a bedtime for your children. Nothing wrong with bedtimes. Now, bedtimes can degenerate into legalism if you become convinced that a child should be in bed by 8.30 if they're truly going to be spiritual, and then you take your 8.30 time and you start running around 
to everyone else trying to convince them that 8.30 is the spiritual time for bedtime in my home and it will work best for you. You want your kids to be spiritual? Get them in bed at 8.30. That's what you do. I know these are kind of ridiculous, but hopefully it helps you to think through the, the way legalism tends to work. We have to have pragmatic rules to survive in the home and the church. But when we begin to lift up those rules as laws of spirituality for ourselves or others and try to import them into the lives of others for some sort of benefit, spiritual benefit, then we are in trouble. Do you need to read the Bible regularly? Of course you do. The Old Testament and New Testament alike gives us that thrust. Do you have to read the Bible at 4 a.m. to be spiritual? Some of you have great quiet times at 4 a.m., right? It's really quiet, <laughs> except for your snoring. <laughs> but having your quiet time at 4 a.m. doesn't necessarily make you more spiritual than those who have it at some other time, right? And I think we could say, well, here's some principles from the Old Testament, especially of rising up early and worshiping God and reading the Scripture and all that, but you can't make that a law. <laughs> Variety of lifestyle choices that people make that can not be proven scripturally but they make those choices and it sort of helps their family to function as best they can discern in their context the bible tells us to train up our children right but i can tell you this the bible is a lot less specific about what that looks like than a lot of the parenting resources that are out there you know the bible tells us how to train up our children train up your children in the discipline and instruction of the lord don't provoke them to wrath that's about it right or the Old Testament teach them God's word in the morning and the, as they walk and when they go to bed. But it doesn't get much beyond that. But it's amazing some of the resources out there, the sort of extrapolations that people have pulled out of starting with Scripture and developing all these principles and rules of parenting that really, if, you, if we're just honest, a lot of the parenting books out there are extremely frustrating. Because they're law upon law upon law upon law, principle upon principle, principle upon principle, A, B, C. You can stop the baby from crying by doing this. You can discipline your children best by doing that. And they've got all this elaborate scheme of things to parenting. We need to, you know, we need to know what God's Word says. And then we need to principalize Scripture and flesh it out in our homes. But we've got to be careful not to become enamored by someone's externals, someone's scheme of things, and miss Christ. You can have a very well-ordered Christ, a well-ordered home that looks nothing like Christ, where Christ is not centered, central and focused, and all the kids might, all the you know, folks at the restaurant may brag on your children. And they just externally line up. They, you know, they, they do all the right things externally. But their hearts are far from God. They've never really seen Christ display. And Christ loved. I don't think I've ever asked any of you whether you have a television or not in your home. I don't really care. I don't really want to know. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. Unless George is playing and I need a place to come watch the game. <laughs> then, I, then it matters to me at that point. <laughs> I don't know if you have uh, cable, satellite, Netflix, or something else. I don't know what you watch on television. Some Christian families offer no television in their home. That's fine. They do other things along with that. But the problem comes when, like one old fiery preacher from earlier TV days reportedly said of the television antenna. Now, some of you parents, you've got to go home and tell your kids what a television antenna is. <laughs> they don't know. But he said the, te the television antenna, I think he's, he's referring to this one, it's, it's the, the horns of the devil. <laughs> so if you go to someone's home, they got a television, they got the devil's box with the horns of the devil on top of the box. And of course, he probably said it like this, devil! <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and if you watch television, then you enter into the devil's domain. That's a problem. That's a problem. We had a guy attend church here years ago, and he told me about a friend of his who was in a church in Texas, and this church has very strict Sabbatarian rules. Sunday was the Christian Sabbath, and one of the things they didn't do at the church was uh, they didn't believe in watching any television on Sunday. And this guy, whose business was golf, <laughs> was watching a uh, part of a golf tournament on television, his friend in Texas, and uh, he received a strong rebuke from the church. 
for watching golf on Sunday. Well, I do think the Lord's Day should be distinct. It should be different. I mean, there's a great opportunity for us to read Scripture and pray and, and engage our families and deeds of mercy and kindness. Lots of opportunities on the Lord's Day. But you're probably not going to come under church discipline here if you watch a little golf <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon. People get wrapped up in all sorts of externals. We can talk about the wisdom of television. We can, talk, we can, do, all, we can do all this sociological studies about television. Fine. Have at it. But we've got to be careful about making those kinds of things laws that we, in which we determine whether someone is spiritual or not. All that to say, I recognize there's a kind of Christian legalism that true Christians can fall into just like there is in mysticism and asceticism. And it's sinful because it diminishes Christ and ultimately that kind of stuff hurts the church. It hurts the church and it will hurt your family as well when you elevate those kinds of things to spirituality. But in our text, I think we're dealing with something different than that. That's a problem. That's got to be dealt with. But here we have a pathway to spirituality that likely professes Christ, but in reality is completely severed from Christ. I don't think these are real Christian teachers that are sort of off base a little bit. I think they're outside the gospel. But their teaching involves Christ, it involves spirituality, and, so, and, it, and it really looks holy. It's got a real holy appearance about it. And so some folks in the church are looking at that and say, wow, I wish I could be that devout. I wish I could be that holy. What do you have? What's your secret? What's your secret? Let me in. And they're glad to do that. They're glad to let you in on their secret. But they lead away from Christ, verse 19 says. Initially, it's, here it's connected to diet and days. Let me clarify something I said last week. I said something about a loaf of bread with a Bible verse on it as a means to spirituality. I didn't, I didn't mean that it's wrong to eat healthy. I didn't mean it's wrong to, you know, if you've got some good bread and good grain and you've got some business savvy and you want to market that, go for it. I'm with you. Count me in. Make me an investor. I've got 10 bucks. I'll throw into the lot there. I'm not opposed to in and out Burger having John 3.16 on their Coca-Cola cups. That's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we sort of create a diet, for example, that is God's diet. If we really want to be spiritual, then we're going to go, we're going to follow God's diet. We're going to follow God's diet and we're going to observe God's special Jewish festival days and new moon days and Sabbath days. So that's what we are dealing with here, first of all, is, is that uh, this question of food and drink. And again, this is the Jewishness of it, because he talked about the festival, the new moon, and the Sabbath, the annual, the monthly, the weekly celebrations, or the weekly requirements for the Jews that set them apart from the other nations of the world. Israel existed to display to the nations of the world that there's one God, they're his people, they live a distinct life. And so connected to all of that, were these special rules and regulations connected to Israel in the Old Testament that are not applicable as far as keeping them in the New Testament. We learn from them, but they drive us to Christ, those things. And so he says, don't let anyone get you off course, rob you of your freedom, take away your joy, pass judgment on you and questions of food and drink. These are a shadow, and maybe you saw are, and you wonder, well, maybe they're still ex in existence. And they're pointing to things that are still to come. But the Greek grammar here is standing back in the Old Testament. These are the shadows pointing to that which is in the future that is now fulfilled in Christ. So it is foolish. It is ridiculous. It is of no use to you to sort of go back into Old Testament times, resurrect the feast and the, the new moons and the Sabbaths and make those things, well, the folks that observe these festivals are really spiritual people. And in fact, you've got to do this if you're going to reach that higher plane of spirituality. He, the only things those have to do with Christ is that they point to Christ. And when we study those things, we see Jesus, we rejoice that Christ has fulfilled all of that stuff. 
So we don't have to celebrate the annual feast and the new moons or the Jewish Sabbath anymore. But we look unto Christ. That's the key. That's what Paul continuously is driving them back to Jesus Christ. But the legalistic person, he develops rules and lists. If you check off the rules and check off the list, then you can be holy. And he loves the list and he loves the rules. And he pulls a verse to go with those lists. But the New Testament has surprisingly little to say about external things. About diets and days and parenting and lots of things that we get excited about. Lots of things that we get all worked up about. And we find our gurus that we really like. Well, I really like this guy. You're not going to believe what he teaches about A, B, C, or D. And we sort of gravitate over to this guy and his teaching and his school of thought. We get all excited about that. But the Bible keeps us focused on the heart. And when we get to chapter 3, that's what Paul is going to aim at with deadly accuracy. He is going to aim at the heart in purity and passion and evil desire and covetousness and anger and wrath and malice and slander, obscene talk and lying, all those things that come out of the heart. That's where he's going. That's what the Bible is driving at. Who are the ultimate legalists in the New Testament? The Pharisees, right? Nobody was as religious and as holy externally as the Pharisees. I mean, when they prayed... Everybody could hear it. Boy, they really could pray. I mean, you say, wow, we need to write that down, put it in a prayer book. <laughs> and when they fasted, everybody felt sorry. Oh, boy, look how holy they are. They're really suffering. They're fasting because they let it be seen in their appearance. They're fasting. And boy, do they like to give in a way, not out of a generous heart, but they like to give in a way to be seen by others. That's what the Pharisees did. They were always focused on the external things. And what did Jesus say about them? You're nothing but whitewashed tombs. There are bones inside of your heart. There's deadness inside of you. You can clean up the outside all day long, and it's not going to change your heart. The Pharisees were all about that. They'd go take a bath that they accidentally brushed up against a Gentile. These are the folks who killed Jesus, by the way. This is why legalism is so deadly. These are the folks, the religious, holy people who said they were zealous for God, who did all of these external religious things. These are the people who killed Jesus, who was a friend of sinners. These are the people who killed the one who took sin-laden people like Mary Magdalene and made her his daughter, made her new. This is the man who told the woman caught in adultery, repent. Repent. Go and sin no more. He didn't say go clean up your act. He didn't say go wash the outside. He said repent. Where does repentance begin? In the heart. In the heart. Rules-centered, so-called Christianity is deadening. In fact, it is anti-Christ. It's anti. It's like the Pharisees. It's all externally focused. A few years ago, 50s, 60s, 70s, it was, you know, every generation of, of pious people have their rules, right? Some of you can remember when it was card playing and movies and hair length and mixed bathing. <laughs> you, know, you know what mixed bathing is? It's swimming, you know, <laughs> boys and girls at the beach together and pool together or whatever. That's, what, that's the way it was described back in the day, mixed bathing. Didn't mean getting in a bathtub, but. It was uh, dancing. But when I was in college, it was also backwards masking. You ever done any backwards masking? You know what that is? Come on, guys. I'm not, the, I'm not that old. <laughs> well, backwards masking, this is the way the devil got his message onto records. You know, record. You know, that's a vinyl. It's, a piece of, it's vinyl, and it's got songs on it. So like a, a large CD, <laughs> back in style. And so the devil got his message on records through backwards masking. And so what we would do, we'd sit in the room and people would tell us, if you listen to this Led Zeppelin song, that was one of the big ones, Led Zeppelin song. And, you, and so we, we listen to it and then we, we take it and we slowly turn it backwards. And then... <laughs> and eventually you could make out something that sounded a little bit like 666. 
that was a big, that was pretty popular in my day in college. So Christians are all worked up about records. You know, we've got to break the records. We've got to burn the records. We've got to get rid of the records. The devil's message is playing backwards on the records. Well, I'll tell you, I've got some news for you. On some of those records, the problem wasn't with the devil putting his message on backwards. The problem was the message was on forward. <laughs> That's where the message was. We didn't have to go looking for secret messages. It was right there, right there for us. Christ is the end of law to all who believe, Romans 10, 4 says. Mark 7 tells us that as well. In Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. True spirituality is not based on rule keeping, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. So don't get sidetracked. Let no one pass judgment on you on these things. Don't get sidetracked by legalistic people who in this case dip back into theonomic regulations designed to display Israel's God as the one true God. Don't go back to the annual feast, monthly festivals, the Sabbaths as a means of spirituality. These were the shadows. Jesus has come. Let's worship Him. Let's worship Him. 